Russ Groman from RC Astro has released a new tool and it is free. It is not an exterminator in any kind of way, but he calls it the MTF analyzer. And I will tell you all about it in this video. Hey, this is View Into Space. I'm Sascha from Switzerland. So grüezi miteinander and thanks for watching my channel. So this new tool that Ross has actually published is a web tool. So it's not connected to PixInsight and it does not modify your picture. But it gives you valuable information and answers questions like what camera does really fit to my scope? What scope makes sense for me? Where can Blur Exterminator help and where it cannot help? And it gives you very good information if you're undersampled, if you're oversampled, if you should use spinning, if you should drizzle, and so on. And we will look at that now in detail on a computer. Okay, welcome to my computer. And this is the new tool, RC Astro, Modulation Transfer Function and Image Sampling Analyzer, or short MTF Analyzer. Still doesn't sound as cool as Exterminator, but given it's free, we accept the title. So let's see what we can do with it. First, here we have to enter the data of our telescope, either the one we have or the one we want to look at. So either we go with a perturture and focal ratio or focal length and focal ratio. I rather like to go with focal length and focal ratio. So let's start with something. I start with an easy one, my ASCAR 400. So we have 400 millimeters. Sometimes it's easier just to type it, okay? We have a focal ratio of f5.6. Now the next thing we have to enter is the seeing. So here the default is two arc seconds, which is called an average seeing. But that it really makes sense, you should either enter here the seeing conditions that you typically have at your backyard, if you shoot from there, or where you usually go to shoot. Now you might ask, how can I know? How can I figure out what my seeing is? And actually, thanks to a member of my Patreon community, I found this great site here. This is meteoblue.com and they actually have an astronomy page where you can look for free for the next three days how good the seeing is. So this is a little bit what we already know, the, the cloud cover, low, medium, high. But then beside that here you see the seeing in arc seconds and that's exactly what we need. So for example, here tonight I have a rather good seeing of about 1.4. Now I could actually go forward here and it stays within these frames. So I actually have here where I live a better seeing condition usually than the 2.0. That's good to know. So with that information, I go back to the tool and I say, well, usually my seeing is about 1.5. Now the next thing we have to enter is the wavelength. The 550 nanometers are about an average for the visible light. So we can leave it at that, or if you're very specific, if we want to know it mostly for HA, for example, or if we do a lot with O3, we could obviously enter here specifically the nanometers for these emissions. The next thing we have to enter is the pixel size of your camera. That is for my 2600, 3.76. Next, we have to enter the sensor size. So again, for my 2600 MC, that's the sensor size by pixels. Drizzle binning, we leave at the moment at none. And so now we have entered everything. And now we get a lot of data and curves. And quite honestly, if you do not watch this video right now, this is, this is rather confusing and actually there's a lot of text down here which you can read and I read this and I still had issues to comprehend. And thankfully someone recorded for me the speech about convolution that Ross did at the NIF um, convention just in New York and that really helped. And um, based on that, I think at least to the level I can't comprehend it. 
I think I understand how this whole thing works and I try now to explain it to you. So the first thing we have to understand are these dimensions. So here the contrast. In principle, in the most ideal case, you have a contrast of 100%, which means you get the full intensity of each and every dot. Now, the lower the contrast gets down, the more these differences in brightness fade. So the less you can see it, the less optimal it is until they are by zero when, where they completely disappear. On this axis here, you best go to spatial frequency. And now if we go to image space, in principle, only the numbers here change, the rest is the same. But in, in principle, what it means is if we go over here, the more or the higher the resolution is. So the more individual differences by millimeters can be resolved. And that's what we want, right? We want to have the highest resolution possible. That's also why we go with smaller and smaller pixels, because when we have smaller pixels, it means we can resolve more. If we go with a better optics, it means we can resolve more. Now, instead of the image space, you could go with the object space. And what it actually means here is each of these little bits per millimeter, which I just said, so the, the, the resolution, what does it actually mean from an arc second point of view and an object? And then that's what you have here. But I think it's actually easiest to, to understand with the image space and spatial frequency. So these many pixels in principle differences per millimeter can be displayed. Okay, now we know what these two axes are. Now let's go to the many curves. So let's start with this one, the diffraction limit. And that really means based on your aperture or your focal length, your focal ratio, what can your telescope resolve given that you have the most ideal optics. That's this line here. So let's say you buy a Takahashi, which really has amazing optics. Based on the focal length, the focal ratio, this is what it's capable of resolving if everything else is absolutely perfect. But as we always know, not everything is perfect, right? So now let's look at the new next two curves. The orange one is pixels plus diffraction, meaning we have the diffraction limit here, plus we also have a certain number of pixels. And obviously that's the maximum we can resolve the amount of pixels that we have. And as you see, this goes down here. So now we already don't have this whole resolution of contrast anymore because my camera sucks. <laughs> so I'm just kidding, but that's the issue. In principle, the pixels are too big for what this scope would be able to resolve. And then comes the blue line and that's the seeing. So again, we go with the maximum diffraction and then we deduct the seeing. And you see it's almost at the same level as the under sampling that I have because of the camera. Now the issue is even it's almost at the same level, this adds up and in a total I get here the receipt for everything that's bad. And this white line at the very end is really what I can resolve with my camera, my telescope, my seeing conditions. So the question is, what does that mean now? Well, it means, first of all, I'm undersampled. Secondly, it means if I do not do any deconvolution, somewhere around here, you know, it gets blurry and, um, not very good anymore. So I have actually a really a, a good contrast. If we go with 50%, I have only about 70 cycles per millimeter. So that's not really good. And here is where blur exterminator comes in because blur exterminator, what it actually does, and I think it illustrates here perfectly. All that blur exterminator does is it takes this contrast, which is rather low, rather faint, and amplifies it up here, up here, up here. So that all this area here has now a full contrast. And so it kind of retrieves this rather faint 
parts. Now there's something to realize. Whatever here is red is where we're undersampled. And that information is lost. Because if I don't have it depicted in my pixel, also Blur Exterminator cannot guess. So at about 135 cycles per millimeter, or about 0.26 cycles per arc seconds, it's game over. But it's already much better than what I have without Blur Exterminator. Now there's something else to notice. What can destroy this is noise. Because if I have noise, then these low contrast areas, they get drowned in the noise. And that's why actually people who say that, well, you can just take a few cell phone photos and Blur Exterminator will do a fantastic job. It's not true. And it's also the reason why some people say that actually Blur Exterminator has almost no effect. Because if you do not take enough picture, enough integration time, and based on that, you have a lot of noise, Blur Exterminator cannot do anything because this information is lost. So that Blur Exterminator really to this level here can increase everything to perfection. It needs to have a picture without noise. And that doesn't mean denoising by Noise Exterminator. That means really having actually enough integration time to remove the noise through that. Now that said, can we do something about this here? Yes, obviously I could buy a new camera with smaller pixels, but then there's drizzle, right? What if I actually drizzle? Let's try that out. And, oh my God, all the undersampling is gone. And so also that is something great, which actually this tool enables. You can actually play with drizzle and binning and see if it helps you. So now actually if I drizzle, I can easily be at 0.3, you know, we don't go down to zero here, but if you're realistic, by about 5%, we're about 0.35 cycles per arc seconds, or about 180 cycles per millimeter, which I can now fully resolve. And so this is the information that I need now. I have to drizzle with my FRA 400 in the combination that I have here, and then I can get really good results again if I accumulate enough integration time. So with that, let's try my other telescope and let's see what's happening there. And that's my CPC 800, so completely different story. You have a focal length of 2032 and a focal ratio of 10. Everything else stays the same. So here we have now a completely different situation. We have here again the diffraction limit. And then if you look at the pixels now here, we're almost equivalent. So here, my camera can really fully resolve what the telescope can actually send to it. That's great. But then comes the big issue. And in principle, the blue line and the, the white line, they're lying on top of each other. And the reason is that everything that matters here is the seeing. And you see that easily if I go now to seeing and if I start to move it. You see that? These lines, they move right on top. And now actually, if I want to have a decent resolution with the scope, I would have to go somewhere where you would have seeing conditions 0.6 arc seconds. But where do you find that? You really have to go up a hill with your 60 kilogram telescope on the back, right? Somewhere high up in the sky where you really have perfect, pristine seeing conditions. And if you do it like me from the flatlands, you get subpar results. If you now, for example, go to an average of a 2.0, this is really, really bad. All this here, we lose. And obviously here we could say now we're binning because, and you see that it has almost no effect here. We have less pixels. So that will probably be the better solution here. So if you go now back to the 1.5, what I have here, we take again the about 5% here. We're at 57 cycles per millimeter and about 0.5 cycles per arc second. And I want to make a last example and stick with me because there is a message behind it. 
and something which I really want you to consider. So we will now take a last example and let's say I just won the lottery. So I go crazy. And so I decided I go for this here, the CFF 600 millimeters F8 Ricci Creatin Telescope. It just costs 45,000 euros, but hey, I wanna make really cool pictures. So let's buy it. So this monster has 4,800 millimeter focal length and an aperture of F8. So I already entered that here and look at that. There's all this potential which we lose simply because of seeing. And if you look at that, what it really means, image space, we're at about 30. And object space, we are about 0.65 cycles per arc seconds. Now, if you go back, we have with the CPC 800, we have 0.5. And with the FRA 400, we have 0.4. Now the point really is, if you shoot with this monster, and by the way, let's see how many kilograms this has. <laughs> this is about 65 kilograms, 130 pounds. And this is just the scope, this is not the mount yet. So this is not movable. So these 45,000 euros, they would have been for nothing if I wanna put it in my front yard. That this money pays off, I really have to put it in Chile on the best optimal mountain possible. And I really mean, even if I go down here to the 0.5 seeing, we're still, we're good, but you know, actually we, we, we would need it better <laughs> to really make sense of that. And what this really shows is that there is a limit where it even doesn't matter anymore how much money you have you can simply not go pass by, except you have really a professional observatory with adaptive optics who can really adjust the seeing. And so this, I think, is really the power of this tool. On one side, you can really see for your scope if you should be drizzle, if you should be binning. So that's great. And also get a little bit of reality check based on your seeing where you actually are. So it could actually be that for one night, you actually should be drizzling. For the other night, you shouldn't, depending on your seeing. And you can actually try this out and then look it up on Meteor Blue, what your seeing is for this night, and adjust. But on the other side, if you're in for a new camera, for a new telescope, it really makes sense to do a reality check here if that scope even makes sense for your seeing conditions and also based on your seeing conditions, what camera actually gives you the best bang for the box. So that was it already. I hope this was helpful. If you would like to have such breaking news as soon as possible, if you want to have more information about the MTF analyzer, please join my Patreon channel. Link is in the description below. See you next time and clear skies. Bye.